Thank you, Mary. Well, good morning, everybody. It's such a glorious day outside, isn't it? It's been a glorious week, and I'm in no doubt that there are some people watching on ho- at home in the garden right at this moment. Um, like Steve and Andy, I'm also part of the staff team. My name is Emily, and um, I'm not normally upstairs at this point on a Sunday morning. Normally, I am downstairs with the children or the young people, and one of the children came up to me this morning and said, which group was I in today? They wanted to know where I was going to be today, and I said, today, I am in the adult group. And um, so I think she was a bit sad. But um, there we are. It's your, your gain this morning. And um, this morning we are continuing, as Josie said, our series looking at the last few words of Jesus before he died on the cross. And a bit of a recap if you haven't been here or if you have forgotten. So far we've looked at Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. Di introduced us to that theme. Then following on we have Paul who talked to us about, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise when Jesus was talking to one of the thieves next to him on the cross. And then last week we had Colin leading us through the theme of lament in the words of, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And today, as we just heard, we're going to be looking at this phrase, woman, here is your son and here is your mother. And it's fair to say that in the life of Jesus as a whole, but particularly his last few weeks, he said and did a lot of things. And the challenge when um, you're leading or preparing some sort of series is, what do we focus on? Because there's no way that we can cover absolutely everything. You know, this series is six weeks long, and we're only scratching the surface with what goes on over the Easter story. And so, just very briefly with the person next to you, what are the first 10 things? things that come to your mind when you think about the Easter story? What are the 10 things, like the 10 events or the 10 sayings that first come to mind? There's no right or wrong ones. When you hear the word Easter, what are the 10 things from the Bible that you think of? Off you go. Okay, so hopefully you've grappled with that as well, because the more you start thinking about it, the more you start realizing, oh, there's that, and there's that, and they said that, oh, and then they appeared, and where does it begin? Does it begin at Palm Sunday, or does it begin years and years and years ago? Where does Easter begin, and where does it end? And I'm sure there are certain bits that we all thought of, like the Last Supper, or the Garden of Gethsemane, maybe Judas's betrayal, or Peter's denial, the two thieves on the cross either side the tomb, the resurrection, and they're all great things, and they are all important things, but we know that there is so much more to the account of Easter than just those perhaps key events that first come to our minds. Now, does anyone know what this is? And I appreciate it's very tiny, so I have to shout it really loud. It is an Easter egg. Brilliant. I was going to throw it, but I'm not going to throw it. You can get it at the end. It is an Easter egg. And uh, we see Easter eggs in our shops from about the 26th of December until the end of April. Um, And I love them, so um, I'm not disappointed by that. But there is the word Easter egg that has a very different meaning in the world of media. In the world of media, does anyone know what the word or the term Easter egg means? Yes. 
It is. So in the world of media, film, or TV, or video games, it's a hidden thing that is put inside of it that actually has a meaning, but it's a little bit subtle. So I'll give you an, ex um, an example. So the program The Simpsons, who would like to confess to ever having watched The Simpsons? Yes, lots of people. Now, on the hand of a Simpson, so the Simpson family, how many fingers are there? Forget the thumb. How many? Ooh, 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 a bit of a debate. OK, so there are four okay, on their hands. But when God appears in The Simpsons, because actually church and God does appear quite a lot in The Simpsons, how many fingers are on God's hands? Does anyone know? It is five. Yes, very good. Now, that is never pointed out explicitly. They're never introduced, here is God, he has five fingers. Um, they don't do it like that, but there is a hidden meaning, an Easter egg, if you like, in it. Because what it's showing is that God is different to humans, and that is the way that they decided to portray it in The Simpsons. And what I love about this series of these last few phrases of Jesus is that even in the smallest bit, the smallest phrases, the smallest interactions, actually there is often a hidden meaning. There is something deeper than we can glean from it. Often they can get lost in the big events of Easter, but actually if we look a little bit closer, God has got something to say. So let's set the scene for where we are at this point, and this is why we've got uh, this display over here. So at this point in the story, we have got Jesus. He is nailed to the cross. He is being crucified. Either side of him, we have got the two thieves. One of them he had that interaction with, saying, today you'll be with me in paradise. And below, we have got a few people. We've got the soldiers who are mocking him and are throwing dice, casting lots for his clothes. And then we've got a group of women that we heard their names of. We've got this group of women, and then we've also got a disciple. Let's start with the group of women. Who were they? Well, when you look at the different Gospels, there is a bit of, they differ slightly as to who the women were. But we know that one of them was definitely Mary, Jesus' mother. And these were the women that had followed Jesus all throughout his life and the ones that would be seeing him in a few days' time at his resurrection. So we've got this group of women. And then amongst them, we have someone named the disciple who Jesus loved, which theologians think actually that that is John, John the disciple. Now, you can read that and think, gosh, what an ego that John had, that all throughout his gospel, he refers to himself as, I am the disciple who Jesus loved. And can you imagine them all meeting someone new and going through and saying, hi, I'm Matthew. Hi, I'm Thomas. Sorry, cameraman, I'm moving really a lot. I'll try not to move as much. Um, hi, I'm Judas. Hi, I'm the disciple that Jesus loved. Like, obviously, he didn't do that. But can you imagine... But actually, that is not the case at all. That is not what John is trying to portray by saying that he is the disciple whom Jesus loved. What John is actually wanting to portray is the fact that it's all about Jesus. He doesn't want his name mentioned. He doesn't want it to be all about him. I am the disciple that Jesus loved. It's about Jesus and his love for him, but also his love for us. And at this moment, out of all the disciples, John is the only one present. The others had fled for their lives. Peter had denied him. And they fled their lives because they knew that their lives were at risk. And now we don't know where they were, but we assume that they were somewhere safe. But I imagine they also felt a little bit guilty and perhaps a little bit ashamed that they had deserted their friend. So now as Jesus is nailed on that cross, all he has are some people mocking him, some crowds watching him, a few women, and John. But I think it's quite brave that they were there. And the authorities, it's thought, actually, well, the authorities could have arrested them. They could have arrested them for being um, friends of Jesus. But at that time, women were massively influential. They didn't have much power. So there wasn't that much chance of them being able to continue the work of Jesus into the future because they were only women. That was the culture at the time. 
But why was John there? Well, people have studied it and think that John was perhaps a young boy. So a bit like women, he didn't have a lot of influence. So actually, he wasn't much of a threat. We don't need to arrest him either. But I still think that actually they were really brave people to associate themselves with Jesus, the King of the Jews, right at the end there. Surely they couldn't have been 100% certain that they weren't being to get killed or arrested. And it challenges me to think what my response would be if I was one of the disciples. How far would I have been willing to follow Jesus, to be with him? To what cost would I have gone all the way to the end like that group did? Now, we in this country are unlikely to be persecuted for our faith. We might get mocked or bullied a little bit, but actually our lives are not at risk. But I wonder whether we're sat here this morning a little bit too comfortably. Are we willing to follow Jesus to a point where actually it costs us something? And I remember as a teenager going to an event up in Exeter and this question being posed to us. If Christianity became illegal in the UK tomorrow, would they find enough evidence to convict you? I'll say that again. If Christianity became illegal tomorrow, would they find enough evidence to convict you? And that's a real challenge, isn't it, to ourselves? Now, going back to this moment here, it's quite easy to have a guess as to what the emotions were that were being displayed at this point. Mary would have been absolutely heartbroken, and that's an understatement. Her eldest son was about to be crucified, or was being crucified right before her eyes for having done nothing wrong. Not only had his birth been a little bit unexpected and strange in terms of who was there, his life had then been a little bit well, controversial and difficult for her to watch. And now he's being crucified. But Mary was there from the start right until the end, which is something that no parent hopes that they'll be able to do. And I want to acknowledge those of you who have experienced that for yourselves. And I wonder, as Mary stood there and she wept and she questioned if she was reminded of this prophecy that we'll see from Simeon. If you remember when Jesus was born as a young boy, they took him, Mary and Joseph, up to the temple to be presented to God. And when they got there, they had Anna and Simeon who shared prophecies over Jesus' future. And this is the one that Simeon shared. If we can have it up, please. Fab. This child, Jesus, is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Now to get that prophecy spoken over your child when they're being presented at the temple, I mean it's not It's not really a cheery, happy, joyful one, is it? It's one full of actually disruption and difficulty and conflict even. And I wonder if Mary, when she sat at the cross here, if she knew all that was going to happen to Jesus and during his lifetime, if she still would have said yes when the angel Gabriel first appeared to her. And I wonder whether Boris Johnson, if he knew all that would happen during his time as Prime Minister, with Brexit and COVID in Ukraine, whether he would still have said yes to that role. And I wonder whether you, in your lives, can think of a time where you said yes to God, and it didn't quite pan out as you had expected. Perhaps you're sat here this morning, and God is inviting you, encouraging you to say yes to something but your mind is full of questions and full of doubts, as I'm sure Mary's was when she said yes to giving birth to the Son of God. But we know, don't we, that God is a God who is trustworthy and is loving and is faithful. But we also know that when we say yes to God, it's often costly. If you think that becoming a Christian, suddenly you have no difficulties in your life and life is easy and no struggles, no issues, then I'm sad to say that that's very wrong. 
Well, that's my experience anyway. Because the truth is that following God has to cost us something. It costs us our lives. But often it costs us something more. It sometimes costs for our families as well. And for those of you that have been missionaries abroad or have had family members go abroad, I imagine there's that real excitement when someone says yes to following God's call to a certain place. But there's also that sadness for the person as they leave family members behind, but also that sadness in those left behind that that family member is going, those mixed emotions that are going on. Here, for Jesus, the ultimate cost was his life and an excruciating death. And for Mary, the cost for her, as it said in Simeon's prophecy, was she would experience pain like a sword piercing your own soul. But here in this moment, and this is what always blows my mind, in this moment where Jesus is on the cross experiencing excruciating pain, he's not thinking of himself. He's thinking of other people. He's thinking of his mother and how she would be looked after. And we might think, why did he leave it to the very last minute to make these arrangements? But I think it's showing his humanity, first of all. Those of us that perhaps have um, had people close to us die, it's towards the end that they start having those conversations about, oh, make sure you look after them and make sure that that's okay and that's all sorted. Jesus in humanity at the end of his life is wanting to know that his mother is going to be taken care for. But also we see his selflessness, that in his darkest hour, he's thinking about his mother and John, but he's also thinking about every single one of us who he was dying for. Whilst Jesus was dying for you and dying for me, he wasn't thinking of himself. He was thinking of us. And Mary at this moment, I wonder whether she'd even considered herself what her future now looked like. The custom in the day was for the husband to care for the women in their family. But we can assume at this point that uh, that Joseph is no longer here, that Joseph has died. And so Jesus, being the eldest son, he is the person that has the family duty to care for his mother. But I wonder whether Mary had even considered herself who was going to care for her when Jesus had gone. After Jesus had died, it normally would go to the family members, and we know that Jesus had other brothers. But here we see Jesus asking John to take care of his mother. A little bit like Paddington Bear came to England with a label that said, please look after this bear. Jesus is asking John to please look after his mother. Now you might think, well, what about Jesus' brothers? They were around, were they not capable of looking after her? Well, it wasn't that they weren't up to the mark. It was more that Jesus, he wasn't looking for someone to look after his mother in terms of financial support. More that actually he was bothered about who was going to care for his mother and her faith and her spirituality. Because at this point, it doesn't appear that Jesus' brothers were even believers of Jesus himself and that he was the son of God, although they did come to be. Jesus cared for his mother's faith, and he wanted, she wanted, he wanted John to care for her. And right at that moment when he said, woman, here is your son, disciple, here is your mother, a new family was formed. A new family was formed. And it's at the cross where each of us have met each other, as we have each recognized our sin, our need for forgiveness, our need for the love of Jesus, and accepting what he has done for us. We have come to the place of the cross. And we've discovered that, but we've also discovered that we are not alone. We're now part of a great big family called the church. People that aren't connected um, biologically or through human blood, but people who are united and connected by the blood of Jesus. And as we look around this room, we're a whole mismatch of people, aren't we? We're not really the same. Probably if we didn't come to church, we wouldn't even hang out with each other. You know, we're very, very different But actually, the one thing that unites us all and unifies us is Jesus. And he has called us his 
church. And unity is something that is so important to Jesus. He prayed it before he went to the Garden of Gethsemane, that we would have unity with each other. And this is a little snippet of what he prays in the garden. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity Then the world will know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Now, that can be a bit complicated to understand, but it's important to have this sense of unity. This is something that Jesus prayed. He is a real priority for his church here on earth. But it's not just our oneness that is important. Jesus wants us to love each other in our oneness to love each other in the same way that he loved us. And it says this in John 13, I give you a new commandment, this is Jesus saying this, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You must also love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So it's clear that for Jesus, there's something important about unity, about family, and also about love. Not that it's just great for each of us that get to be part of that, but it seems to be some sort of witness to the world outside that they will recognize things if we are unified and if we show love to each other. And sometimes as a church, we're not so great at doing that, and maybe we've been on the receiving end of that. But when it's done really well, it is beautiful. About um, for a few years ago, I had, um, thankfully, this was the worst accident I've ever had in my life. I'm very fortunate that this is it. But um, I was at a church holiday club, um, and uh, I had an accident. And with it being a few years ago, I was not six or seven as a child having an accident. But I was co-leading this holiday club and uh, playing uni hoc in the hall with the older kids. And one of the leaders, um, other leaders came up and... Uh, bumped into me and because of their size and stature sent me flying across the room and I landed on the back of my head and my neck and I screamed like I've never screamed before. The pain was excruciating and so whilst my colleague carried on, uh, right let's get everyone into the church and we'll like do this other stuff with like these children and okay we'll forget about the games. Uh, The ambulance came and the stretcher came out and I was put on the stretcher and had my head squeezed between two lovely boards like this and was taken off to hospital. And it was highly, highly humiliating, but so, so painful. And uh, at that point, I was up near Norwich, so so far away from family and friends. I'd only been at that church for about six months. But the whole church at that point literally had to become my family. They were the closest thing that I had, both in terms of distance um, and in terms of people. And I had people that came and had a small sleepover in my house, I suppose, because I had a head injury. I couldn't be by myself. I had people showing me all of the different types of love that the love languages, if you're familiar with, show. I had people show me love through physical touch. People gave me very gentle hugs or that pastoral you know, hand on the shoulder. I had people show me love through acts of service. People had to drive me to appointments with the physio or to get acupuncture or for the MRI scan. I had people, and I really had to humble myself at this point, people had to come and do my washing for me because I couldn't, I couldn't lift a kettle uh, and I couldn't you know, peg things out on the washing line. And when people in your church come and hang out your washing, you've really got to humble yourselves as to what it is that they are seeing before their eyes. I also had people show me love through gifts. I had meals. I mean, I ate like a queen because everyone wants to cook like the best thing for you. I had chocolate posters through the door. Um, And I had quality time. People came and spent short bits of time with me because that's all I could cope with. But they were showing me love through spending time with me. And then words of affirmation, people sent me cards and texts and verbal ways of showing love 
that way. And other people prayed and supported me spiritually during that time. And for me, that is the most church-like moment that I have experienced in all its beauty. It was rough for me. It was rough for my family that lived the other side of the country, thinking, what do we do? But the church really unified and showed love. And I wonder if you in this room have had somebody else in the church show you love, care, or support. Could you just raise your hands? So if someone within the church has showed you love, care, or support, raise your hand. And isn't that, isn't that great? Isn't that just a testimony in itself? Actually, that's what we're designed for, and that's what we're doing. Slightly different question. Can you put your hands up if you've ever received love at a time where actually the timing was perfect. Yeah, the timing was perfect. And perhaps you didn't ask for help in that moment, and perhaps maybe you've been the giver of love and you've thought, actually, God is asking me to drop this round to this person or send this thing to this person, and I don't really know why, but I'm gonna do it. Actually, that is God at work and his timing because the Holy Spirit prompts us to do these things even if we're not sure why and Jesus' mother in her needs she perhaps didn't even recognize the need that she had at that point but God knew about it and we can sit here today knowing that God knows our needs even before we know them ourselves and we might not think that us knowing that Jesus loves us will have an impact on the world. And we might not think that us showing unity like we have with the Ukraine prayer meeting or showing love for each other will have an impact on those around us. But I really think that if we do it well, that it really can. I'm just gonna end by reading a poem that's written through the eyes of a centurion as he watches all of this going on and it will be up on the screen so if you want to read it with me um, not don't read it with me if you'd like to follow it with me you can do or feel free just to look at this scene or close your eyes and imagine it through the centurion's eyes how can a man dying like this think about others how can he think about his mother's future when life is ebbing away from him Why worry about a friend like this? It makes me wonder, who will worry about me when I can soldier on no longer? Who will care about me? Who will worry about my future? I know there's a pension, but who will care like this man cares? I've got friends in the army now, but what about when all that ends? With no army to keep us together, What then? Will anyone care? This man's got friends prepared to wait to stay with him in a place like this. Why do I feel this Jesus is speaking to me? That he's saying things far more important than I've ever heard before. Why do I think his words have a meaning which goes far beyond the here and now? As they nailed him down, I thought, What a waste of a young life. Now he's about to die and I see his friends. I know there is no waste. He's too serene for that. But what about me? What does he see when he looks at me? What would I see if I looked through his eyes? What could this mother of his teach me? And what could this friend teach? Show me. He loves them and they love him. But who loves me? And I wonder whether there are people that we walk past, people that we work with that have those same questions. That when you talk about the love that you've experienced as part of a church, when you talk about that unity, actually they wonder, hmm, maybe I want some of that. Maybe that's something that I crave. Actually, 
We might just think it's a nice part of being church, but if we do it really well and as God calls us to, actually it can be a witness in itself. So the three things, if I nail it down to three things, this passage shows us Jesus' love. Love for every single one of us. Love, care, and concern for each of us. Secondly, that Jesus unites us by his spirit, but also by his death and the blood that was shed for us all. And thirdly, that our love and our unity amongst each other is a really powerful thing. I'm going to invite the band up at this moment. And um, before we sing our final song, a picture is just going to go on the screen behind us. And um, some of you may have seen in the past the blob tree um, that has been around for many years. And uh, the author, that, the author, the illustrator that created all these images um, did them because sometimes it's really hard to articulate how we feel in our relationship with God or with others or with other different issues. And so he went about drawing certain images so that instead of having to put it into words, perhaps you could put it into a picture instead. And so... Um, if the band could just play quietly in the background, I'm going to ask you three questions, and your answer is going to be one of the people on the screen. And you can interpret it in whatever way that you like. First of all, I wonder which of those people best describes your relationship with God this morning. Secondly, which best describes your relationship with the church? It doesn't have to be UV, the church in general. Finally, I wonder whether you can identify somebody else. And I just pray that the Holy Spirit might just put the name of somebody in your mind at this moment. Maybe it's someone in that image that is alone, maybe is outside, maybe doesn't look happy. Just ask God to put the name of somebody in your mind. And then I wonder how you could this week reach out and show them love. We can't do that to every single person. We're too big. But actually, if we all showed love intentionally to one person this week, then that will go a long way. So God, we thank you ultimately for sending your son. And we thank you that even in those two short verses, we can see the love that you have for every single one of us, that you were thinking about us even in your most painful moments. And Jesus, we thank you for the beauty of that new family that was formed at the cross between Mary and John and the new family, the church, that comes together because of your death. Lord, we're sorry for when we get it wrong. But Lord, we really do pray and ask that you would unify us by your spirit and move us into power to show love for one another like you did for us.
God, we thank you that your grace is enough and that is all that we need. And we pray that as we sing this final song together, that you would draw near to us as we draw near to you. Amen.